I'm so happy uh, to be moderating this panel here. It's um, uh, a kind of a diverse collection of papers, uh, yet there's some common themes running through the papers that really kind of speak to my own interests. Um, so it's uh, wonderful to uh, have a chance to kind of uh, engage uh, with these other scholars here. Uh, so my plan is I'll just introduce everyone, uh, and then um, uh, we can, I guess, uh, each give uh, the presentation, and then kind of come together and ask questions and have a discussion. <coughs> Good? Good, okay. So, um, our three speakers. Our first one uh, is Yesenia Bergen, uh, and her paper is entitled Accounting for Children, Slavery, Debt, and the Gradual Emancipation in Columbia. Uh, so Yesenia is a postdoctoral fellow at the Society of Fellows at Dartmouth College and a historian of Afro-Latin America. Um, so, in particular, she specializes in issues related to race, slavery, and emancipation um, in Colombia, the Andean region, and the Atlantic and Pacific worlds. She received her PhD in Latin American history from Colombia, um, and her current book project is now uh, tentatively titled Frontiers of Freedom, Slavery, and Emancipation on the Colombian Pacific. Then our second speaker is Enrique Martino. Uh, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Göttingen uh, in a research group entitled A Global Network for Global History. Uh, so Enrique took his uh, PhD at Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, he's published uh, several articles about colonial labor and is uh, working on a book tentatively entitled The Qualities of Excess, Articulations of Bride Wealth and Contract Labor in a Spanish African Colonial Economy. And finally, our last speaker, uh, Catherine uh, Hummuller, uh, who is a member of the Department of Classical, Near Eastern, and Religious <laughs> Studies at the University of British Columbia. Um, and uh, her specialty is Roman history. Uh, she received her doctorate in classics and a certificate in gender studies from Princeton. Uh, and her paper is titled Freedom in Marriage? Question mark, Manumission, Matrimony e Causa in the Roman World. Okay, so you study that. No, we can get. Oh, wait, oh, Catherine. Okay. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. Do you want to? I do. However, however you want. I feel you're up there. Okay. So I know. We are slaves to our technological. Yes. If I'm up there, then I'm going to welcome our robot over there. Thank you guys so much for coming out and early this early morning. I'm sure some of you had adventures getting here, like I did through the, I accidentally had to participate in the uh, half marathon <laughs> to get here, so I'm a little tired already. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna start by telling you about a single family who lived in the city of Rome uh, in the first century of the Common Era. And we know about this family from this funerary monument that I'm displaying here. Uh, the image um, in the center right here is of an eight-year-old girl, Junia Procula. Um, her parents, Marcus Junius Euphrosinus and her mother Acte, set this up for her um, because she died when she was eight. And that's a, you know, a sad but very common story from the ancient world. Uh, but that's not all that we know about this family. So this is just a family tree. We have the father, the mother, and the daughter. So on the other side of the monument, there is a, a different text that tells us a lot more. And this is actually a curse uh, that the husband, Euphrosinus, puts on his wife, Acti, 
um, when she leaves him after the death of their child at some point. Um, we don't know when, but some point after. Um, and this tells us that the family tree is actually much more complicated than my original sketch. Uh, it looks something like this. Um, and as you can see, I'm indicating a proprietary or ownership relationship with the dotted line and a kin relationship with the solid line. So what we learn from this curse is that Acti had been Euphrosinus's slave before she was freed and then married to him. Her manumission made her free woman allowed her to bear a free child, Junia Procula, um, but it seems that she might have also had children before she was freed. So the curse records that when she left Euphrosinus for this other man, she took with her two children from the household. They were both slave children, a male child and a female child. We don't know if they were her children, but my guess is that they probably were. So this stone is very unusual. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, but the family history that it records is actually not so unusual. So I found, uh, building on the work of Matthew Perry, about 300 inscriptions in total that record marriages between former slaves and former owners. Um, and these come from all over the Roman world, um, all over the Western Roman world, the Latin speaking Roman world. So I have just as two examples here. Uh, one on the left, sorry, yeah, right here, <laughs> from the city of Rome, you know, very small, modest, um, and then this extremely expensive, decorated uh, monument that's from the outer reaches of the Roman Empire up in Britain. So it really, they really span the gamut. And my topic is the relationship um, <clears throat> between these two legal procedures of manumission and marriage. So what did a manumission for marriage cost? the enslaved woman, and what kind of freedom did it create? Well, in the case of the family that I just mentioned, we have some evidence for the former question, what manumission costed. In his curse on Acti for abandoning him, Euphrosinus asserts that Acti was manumitted gratis, free of charge. It's clear, though, whether or not money changed hands, that Euphrosinus did expect something in return for the grant of freedom, and that is marriage. The remainder of the curse, which is pictured here, um, in which he describes all the ways that Acti has cheated him, enumerates exactly what this marriage should have consisted of. Sexual fidelity, companionship, and procreation. So, manumitted for free, she cheated her patron, patron is the former owner, following an adulterer, and she abducted his slaves, a girl and a boy, from her patron while he lay in bed, so that he is left despondent, an old man, alone and despoiled. His language draws attention to the fact that he and Acti were bound by both proprietary and conjugal ties. By referring to himself, right, he's speaking in the third person here, by referring to himself as patron rather than as husband, and using this word cheat, um, which is associated with commercial fraud, he points to her violation of their proprietary relationship. She has failed to compensate him for this manumission by leaving him. At the same time, the identification of her new partner as an adulterer draws attention to their marital bond. And then he goes on to describe his pathetic state, right? He's alone and despoiled um, because she's removed from the household not only her own person, um, but also that of two young slaves. Since we know that Acti and Euphrosinus lost their daughter, right, Junia, when she was eight, perhaps he's alone in another way as well, not only slaveless and wifeless, but also childless and heirless. So his description of himself as an old man draws attention to his impending need for heirs. And I think it calls out Acti for the theft of her reproductive potential. So this stone serves as a fitting introduction to my argument that the manumission of female slaves like Acti for the purpose of marriage was not free. This might sound obvious to many of you, but what I'm sort of fighting against is a tendency in, in the scholarship on classical slavery to talk about manumission for the purposes of 
um, making someone a family member, right? either a wife or the manumission of a child, uh, a natural child, to be sort of a legitimate son. Um, those manumissions are often described as affectionate, right? They're based on um, love and affection, and they, they, they don't create any debt between the two parties. <clears throat> so what I think, though, um, is that freed wives paid for their freedom with their conjugal and reproductive labor. And this transaction was really formalized in Roman law. So a man who freed his slave for the purpose of marriage obtained exclusive rights to his freed wife's conjugal and reproductive labor, not just through the standard rights of marriage that are owned to any husband, but through a more controlling form of marriage. So in return for their manumission, freed wives experienced a less free version of marriage than other Roman wives, and a less free version of freedom than other freedmen and women. To examine the nature of this freedom that's acquired through marriage, we have to turn away from these inscriptions to perhaps a more dry set of material, legal texts. Um, and these are the opinions of classical jurists. Um, these are preserved in a commentary compiled at a later date, but they preserve um, these opinions of these legal experts from the first and second century CE. Um, and that's the sort of time period we're focusing on here. Um, there, were, there was a, a grouping of laws related to the position of these freed wives in this period. They almost certainly didn't introduce the practice of freeing slaves to be a wife, but they formalized what was an existing custom, and they set the terms of the exchange, freedom granted in return for marriage. So <clears throat> the manumission of a slave for marriage was not inherently problematic in the Roman world. It was only men of the highest status, the senatorial elite, that were forbidden from marrying freed women, whether their own former slaves or someone else's. All other men eligible to contract marriage could do so with their freed women, um, and their right to do so was positively identified um, by one of the jurists, Albion. So where anyone wishes to manumit a female slave in order to marry her, and he can without dishonor to his rank, marry a woman of this kind, he should be permitted to do so. The first step was the formal manumission of the intended spouse. And restrictions placed on the manumissions of slaves made it a little harder to formally manumit a slave under the age of 30. We suspect that many of these women would have been under the age of 30, as um, Roman women typically married in their late teens. So to carry out this kind of underage manumission, um, an owner had to present his slave before a council that was specially drawn out for these purposes um, and offer a justification for the manumission. And our sources tell us that marriage was one acceptable justification for this kind of underage um, manumission. But there was also an additional step. The owner then had to swear before the council an oath that he would indeed carry out this marriage within six months' time. And it was the act of marriage within six months that activated the manumission. So until that happened, the woman was still not of free status. And if they didn't get married within six months, the manumission was inactive. She reverted to slave status, as did any children born in that period. So here we come to the first mechanism of control granted to patron husbands and not to other husbands. Whether or not the marriage took place was entirely in the hands of the patron. That is, the marriage did not require the woman's consent. Those who are unfamiliar with the Roman world might think, oh, well, the absence of a wife's consent to marriage, maybe that's not so historically significant. Um, but the Rome, so I have to make the Roman context clear, and that is that consent mattered a lot. Uh, the entire concept of Roman marriage, legal marriage, was based on the principle that marriage was based on intent. It was freely entered and freely exited. So the absence of consent in these cases um, was significant enough that we get another jurist telling us, um, offering additional clarity about this law. So a patron cannot marry his freed woman against her consent. That is, if a woman is manumitted for whatever reason, that doesn't mean that she can be forced into marriage. This rule does not apply, however, where a patron emancipated a female slave matrimony in order to marry 
the, this power then was not derived from patronage alone. It was not possible for a patron to force any of his free women into marriage. The power to compel her into marriage was predicated on this perceived exchange. The woman given freedom for marriage owes marriage. What constituted this kind of manumission, this manumission for the sake of marriage? Well, intent was most clear cut in the underage manumissions that I mentioned, where you actually have to offer a justification before a council. Um, but it's possible um, that a patron could also force a woman into marriage um, in a regular of age manumission. So we hear that it was legal during a manumission for an owner to, and I quote, force his freed woman to swear by oath that she would marry him. So this is potentially another way that at the moment of this transaction of the manumission, the patron could ensure that he would get marriage in return for offering freedom. And the mechanism that's used to compel marriage in this case, the swearing of an oath, um, is the same as that used for establishing what were called operai, which are duties required of a freed woman or a freed woman after their manumission. And these usually took the form of something like they had to bake bread for their patron, perform carpentry or something. And they were a very important element of this continuing relationship between patron and freedman. Um, marriage, it seems, is conceptualized as an alternative type of opera, um, one that's only available to enslaved women. The correlation between marriage and opera is broached again in a different context. The position of women once the marriage was affected, and she occupied the dual roles of wife and freed woman. Freed women were typically excused from performing opera for male patrons if they married a third party. So once they become, became a wife, they no longer had to do these things for the patron. But if their patron and husband were the same person, <laughs> that presents a problem. So in the early third century, um, we hear again um, in our legal texts that a patron could not demand a bride from his freed wife because he had raised her status, he exalted her rank by having married her. But the patron, although he could not be compensated by the performance of Oprah, did enjoy another form of remuneration. And I quote here, you should be satisfied with the benefit of the law which provides that she cannot legally marry another without your consent. So the Oprah are replaced not simply by marriage, but by a marriage in which the balance is tipped in the favor of the husband's control, not only in the formation of marriage, but also in its dissolution. And the laws that constrained a freed woman's uh, freedom of action with regard to entering and exiting her marriage served to amplify what was already an existing inequality in the union. And so here we come to the third and final unusual aspect of, of marriages between patrons and free women. These marriages were, in effect, marriages within a family. So by this period of time, most Roman marriages were free, um, meaning that the wife did not submit to the authority of her husband, but remained located within her natal family um, under her father or grandfather's authority if he was alive. But a free woman, legally speaking, did not have a natal family, and it was her owner that most closely resembles her father legally and socially. So a freed woman married to her father, uh, sorry, married to her patron, marries within her natal family. And the effects of this intersection between marital and natal family are most readily avail uh, visible in the division of property. So in Roman law, spouses were supposed to keep their property separate. Um, and this is a practice that offered some protection to women um, from the control of their husband, if not from the control of their natal family, potentially. Um, but this separation was lost in marriages between freed women and patrons. Presumably, although it's never made explicit, the patron husband would inher inherit the freed woman's property at her death. The patron also acted as the tutor, the financial guardian for their freed women, a role that gave them some control over uh, financial transactions. So all sources of authority coalesced in one individual, placing freed women in a uniquely vulnerable position that, as we've seen, they didn't have the capacity to choose to enter or to exit. 
Um, my overview of the legal position of freed wives has been necessarily brief, um, but I hope that it's enough to show that marriage was a, a route to manumission that changed both the nature of the marriage um, and the nature of the wife's freedom. And the question that remains for me um, is how qualified this freedom really was. Um, and I think this gets to the title of our panel, uh, which is Bound? Still Bound? Free yet bound. Free yet bound. So were they still bound? Um, the freedom of a woman manumitted through marriage is certainly more limited than that of other freed women. And indeed, by many contemporary definitions, this type of marriage would qualify as a form of slavery itself. Um, that is, as uh, slavery under the cover of marriage. The problem is that while the legal sources tell us that patron ha husbands had access to these special mechanisms of control, we have no evidence for how they might have been used in practice. Um, so you might remember that Acti did manage to leave her husband, right? Um, did he do more than curse her, right? That's the evidence we have. Did he take legal action? We don't know whether he did. We don't know whether it would have been effective. So what I think we can recognize is that women freed through marriage occupied a middle ground between the poles of free and enslaved. Um, so if freedom is associated with autonomy, with the ability to leave one's household of purchase, then freed wives were, legally speaking, not free. If, on the other hand, freedom was associated with promotion to a higher status within that same household, or um, what I'm particularly interested in, this transition of ties of ownership to ties of kinship, then, if we conceptualize freedom that way, freed wives were free. I think one of the most significant elements of freedom in a hereditary slave system was likely the ability to bear free children. I think you mentioned this yesterday, yeah. Um, freed wives did bear free children, but they didn't have the ability to choose the father of those children. I think that we must be attuned to the fact that a slave's gender, position in the household, um, childbearing status, and all of these types of features not only affected their chances of manumission, but the particular articulation of freedom that's available to them. Thank you. So next up we have uh, oh, the okay. Great. Sorry. Yesenia, Bar <laughs> Yesenia Barragan. Yes. So. Uh. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out this morning. Um, first just wanted to thank Weave, uh, Yato, and Tristan and all the organizers for putting together this incredible conference. Um, my name is Yesenia and today I'm going to be sharing with you um, really I think what is the heart of my uh, forthcoming book manuscript. So thanks for listening. <clears throat> Her name was Magdalena. We don't know how old she was when it happened, but we know that she was young, una joven, and that her tormentor, her master, believed it to be a moderate punishment, an otherwise reasonable correction for an infraction she had committed. And so her tormentor dragged her to the patio, tied up her feet and hands, and placed an iron bar under her thighs, a torture technique universally employed and perfected by the horrifying perpetrators of Atlantic slavery. There, in the stocks, Magdalena was left alone overnight, only accompanied by the constellation of stars and dangerous animals that roamed the village of Noanama a remote settlement in a secluded riverine countryside of the Pacific lowlands of Colombia in the late 1840s. Perhaps one or more of the five witnesses who testified to Magdalena's torture that evening tried to comfort her. <laughs> 
Perhaps it was the young indigenous woman who the judge eventually dismissed because she did not know her own age. It is this endless perhaps and perhaps and perhaps that collapse into my failure to tell what Sadea Hartman calls an impossible story, to jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received or authorized account, and to imagine what might have happened or might have been, might have been said or might have been done. By the morning, the damage was plainly visible. Magdalena emerged from the stocks, quote, with her left hand permanently disabled, dislocated and atrophied, bearing large scars on her hands. The news of the young Magdalena's torture scandalized local authorities so thoroughly that her tormentor was eventually imprisoned for one year. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, before the final abolition of slavery in Colombia in 1852, Judicial authorities occasionally punished masters for excessively correcting their slaves, though these punishments were often light. But the difference here was that Magdalena, strictly speaking, was not a slave. She was a, quote, criada monomisa, which literally translates into a manumitted slave or servant, a term that referred to the children of the free womb, or the generation of children born to enslaved women after 1821, who were uh, born legally, quote unquote, free, but bonded to their mother's masters until the age of adulthood. Another official even claimed that Magdalena was a, quote, helpless hija de familia, that is, as historian Nara Milanich notes, a minor daughter inserted within the household structure of affect and authority. Her legally distinct status as a child of the free womb and not a slave very likely motivated the court to sentence her tormentor to a year of imprisonment a punishment that rarely occurred to excessively corrected slaveholders. Yet it was her very status as a quasi-slave, and as we'll see here, her status as an unfree commodity within a new debt bondage economy that made her tormentor believe that he could freely break apart her body without consequence in the first place. This talk explores both the construction of and the calculating world made out of the free womb law the central motor of a gradual emancipation policy in the newly constructed Republic of Gran Colombia, a nation uh, encompassing present-day uh, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Panama. Over the course of what would be the final tumultuous months of the wars of independence against Spain in the northern Andes, representatives of Gran Colombia, many of whom were slaveholders, gathered together in the tropical savanna town of Cucuta, Colombia, which you can see uh, they gathered in this church, you can still see it today, in 1821 to craft the future of the young nation. Many of Colombia's earliest and most sweeping liberal reforms were passed in this historic Congress. Chattel slavery, one of the most controversial and contentious legacies of Spanish colonial rule, was also on the negotiating table. And just to give you a sense of the scale of slavery in Colombia in 1825, there were nearly 45,000 um, enslaved people in, a, in Colombia a population about 1,135,000, or about 4% of the population. The vast majority uh, were on the Pacific coast of Colombia where the gold mines were. And today, Colombia is the country with the third largest population of African descent um, that is after the United States and Brazil. The law of the free womb, or La Ley de Libertad de Vientres, was the legislative solution to the problem of slavery in Gran Colombia, a solution inspired in large part, by, in large part by the relentless specter of an all too near black republic of Haiti. Designed to gradually abolish slavery through the wombs of enslaved women, the biopolitical project of the free womb law legislated that all children born to enslaved mothers would be declared legally free, but bonded to their mother's masters until the age of adulthood. And this law sought to uh, gradually abolish the institution of slavery by destroying a legal doctrine that defined the very essence of chattel slavery, that is, partis sequitur ventrum, or the status of the child derives from the mother. This project, then, is indeed one of the earliest, in the words of Christina Sharp, quote, afterlives of partis sequitur ventrum in Colombia. However, Colombia was not alone in pursuing a policy of gradual emancipation in the Atlantic world. And here we can see a sort of bird's eye view of the uh, policies um, overall. The first uh, policy to pass such a law was Pennsylvania in 1780, the first wave 
um, occurred in the northern, northeastern states of the United States, the second wave beginning in 1811 with Chile in the context of the uh, wars of independence against Spain, and then the last uh, wave in the late 19th century with the former uh, Spanish colonies in the Caribbean and Brazil. Nevertheless, despite drawing, destroying the genealogical inheritability of chattel slavery in Colombia, the free womb law simultaneously birthed a new debt bondage economy resting on a technically free yet practically unfree circulation of child and youth quasi-slaves. In short, my project reveals how policies like the free womb law extended and reinscribed slavery through freedom. Determining the age of bondage for the children of the free womb emerged as the central subject of debate during the Congress in Colombia in 1821, an issue that was directly related to the question of debt and compensation to slaveholders. Delegates relied heavily on the racial numeracy of an assumed biological development cycle of enslaved peoples to make their case for establishing a particular period of bondage. So for example, um, Jose Fides de Restrepo, who was a lawyer from Western Colombia and the creator of the gradual emancipation law uh, in Colombia, presented what he considered to be the standard life and work cycle of an enslaved youth in order to show that the children of the free womb could provide ample compensation to their owners despite their future emancipation either at the age of 16 or 18. So Restrepo argued that the first two years of a slave's life imposed little costs on the master, while they would be able to perform small but important domestic tasks, such as running errands, transporting water to the kitchen, tending livestock, and entertaining small children from the age of 9 to 12. Once they reached the age of 12, which was a very important uh, year uh, for Restrepo and other slaveholders, uh, the children were considered to be ready for hard labor with Restrepo claiming that masters could retrieve at least double their investment until the child reached the age of 14. And then from 14 to 18 years of age, the investment, he argued, would quadruple. And in outlining the slave labor development cycle, Restrepo was actually um, applying longstanding uh, ideas regarding uh, age divisions of enslaved youth um, that was developed in the transatlantic slave trade. So we'll see here there are specific um, names talking about um, describing the particular uh, age groups. So, and here we'll see that 12, again, is an important year. Um, the ship from Muleke to Mulekon. After several weeks of deliberation, Gran Colombian delegates voted to set the age of bondage to 18 years old. A controversial decision, 18 years of service was thereby deemed sufficient to repay the owners of female slaves for their, quote, precise obligation of educating, clothing, and feeding the children of all such female slaves. And the contract of debt was written into the law itself, as it stated that the children of the free womb, quote, shall be held, or better yet poached, to compensate the masters of their mothers for the expenses of their rearing by labor and service. Even more, the free womb law let legalize the saleability of the children of the free womb by stipulating that any, quote, persons not of kin or strangers who desire to withdraw the child or use the offspring of a female slave from the possession of the master of the mothers could acquire such a child if they paid their master a, quote, just compensation for the food and support, which was called alimentos, um, to their mother's masters. Oh, sorry, he may have supplied. In other words, strangers could purchase the children of the free womb before they reached the age of 18 by paying the debt incurred in alimentos to their mother's masters. And in so doing, the free womb law established a parallel market of child and youth quasi-slaves, whereby the children were codified as pawns in an emerging Colombian debt bondage economy. Whether accompanied by their enslaved mothers, siblings, or alone, the Colombian children of the free womb were transferable subjects whose alienation and commodification was made legible by the numbers of cows, pounds of jewelry, or pesos that preceded them in the clauses of the last wills and testaments, inventories, or dowries of Colombian slaveholders. Beginning in the 1830s, nearly 10 years after the law uh, was passed, uh, they began to appear in slaveholders' last wills and testaments. And at times, they were listed alongside their uh, mothers and siblings. And we're going to look at uh, one will here by a 
uh, says Will, a um, woman named Leonardo Palacios, and she was a single uh, mother who owned uh, various pieces of land, um, and she was also a slaveholder. And after declaring her various uh, pieces of land, she claimed to own four slaves who were named Jose Candido, Manuel Jose, Feliciana, and Ramona. And Ramona had one child of the free womb named uh, Juan Jose, and another child, very much free, or a child of the free womb as well, named Florencio. As capital, the children of the free womb, in conjunction with their mothers or other slaves, were also used as collateral in mortgages between affluent merchants. In 1839, one merchant owed 1,600 pesos to a man named Nicolas Bonoli, who was an Italian slave, slave trader, whose small slaving empire extended from the Pacific coast jungles of Colombia to Jamaica and Cartagena. As part of a pledge of repayment, the merchant mortgaged his slave Marcos, his wife Maria Antonia, and their daughter Mercedes, free by the law, in addition to another enslaved woman named Isabel and her daughter Venancia, who was also free by the law. Although the children were often purchased as a package with their mothers, they were occasionally bought and sold individually by non-kin, as I mentioned earlier, strangers, an act that further realized their natal alienation. The purchasing of the children required a special note of sale, functioning similarly to a property transfer rather than an outright purchase. The first record of this kind in the Pacific lowlands of Colombia, which is the region that I study, appeared in 1835 under the heading Propiedad de una negrita libre por ley, or property of a young black girl, free by the law. In the record, one female slaveholder sold to her fellow slaveholding sister a seven-year-old child of the free womb named Patrona for 40 pesos to compensate her for the debt incurred over the span of seven years. The record declared that Petrona's former owner would henceforth, quote, desist, renounce, and transfer the property rights over La Negrita Petrona, which had been granted to her by the law of any mission. In slaveholder inventories, notes of sale, mortgages, last wills, and testaments, the children of the free womb circulated as distinct properties and unfree bodies of debt within the greater marketplace of slavery. Over the years of gradual emancipation from the free womb law in 1821 to 1852, when chattel slavery was finally and definitively abolished in Colombia, the imagined post-slavery order would be reimagined once again as Colombian slaveholders shifted the age of bondage in the early 1840s. After July 19, 1839, the entire generation of children born from enslaved women after 1821 were scheduled to turn 18 therefore allowing them to pursue a full freedom beyond their master's reach. But Colombia's uh, first civil war, the War of the Supremes, would modify that timeline. And very briefly, this war was particularly feared by the slaveholding classes in Colombia because of the number of slaves who joined uh, the rebel forces against the new republic. Amidst the onset of civil war, political pressure to modify the free womb law began to build. The age of bondage and thus compensation remained one of the unresolved questions for the master class. Finally passed on May 29, 1842, a system of concertaje was adopted, which was a mandatory apprenticeship program which was influenced by uh, British emancipation, whereby the children of the free women in Colombia would be forced to work under a suitable master until the age of 25, meaning seven more years of forced labor. Ten years after this new law, in 1852, chattel slavery would be finally abolished in the nation of Colombia, and along with it, the free womb law. Perhaps joining her mother, or sister, or cousin, or partner in early 1852, Magdalena would be finally freed from the grips of her tormentor's hold. Yet, the violence of gradual emancipation had been done. Magdalena would never have her left hand back and undoubtedly so much more. Thank you. And so finally we have our final speaker for the panel, Enrique Martino. Thank you very much, good morning. Thanks to the organizers. I'm also happy to have been part of this panel and to follow you since 
great paper, which which helps uh, contextualize my my own paper. Um, because I I kept the title a bit broad to get to the to the crux to, and to also um, try to make bridges across kind of uh, across time time zones. Um, time scales, but then, but in reality, my paper is very, it's very concrete. So it's about the this part of the Spanish Empire in West Africa. Um, Fernando Po is a, Spa a Spanish colony, and it's curious because it, it's it's the equivalent of what Sierra Leone was to the British Caribbean, or what Liberia was to the to the U.S. So it was a, a late 19th century colony uh, whose first settlers were freed slaves. So, um, the, uh, from Cuba, which was still uh, the largest slaveholding colony in the late 19th century, after Brazil, um, came um, came a type of through an apprenticeship program. Um, uh, the the um, uh, a kind of resettlement, but unlike Liberia and Sierra Leone, where there was a pretense but also a space for liberty, the Spanish proceeded to install the plantation colony. In, on, on the African coast, um, and then, and my research has been about the recruitment of labor locally uh, at various points in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, uh, that that was done on the basis of this first kind of founding contract of the of the Cubans who came, a uh, long, irrevocable type of semi a, a semi slavery. So that's the initial context, I'll, I'll read. So down the, the Strait of Gibraltar, past the Canary Islands and Western Sahara, hugging the coast and the illusory coast of inlets and deltas, the next two tall twin mountains imposing themselves as markers for seaborne navigators is in the Bight of Biafra, with the Mount Cameroon on the mainland and the adjacent volcanic peak of Fernando Po on the right side. Uh, this gate, was a navigator signed for having reached an outer place, a desolate, empty axis, quoting, at the extreme edge of the equatorial Atlantic doldrums, as Richard Burton, the British consul on the Spanish island, said in 1862. Up until that point, slave traders had actually always bypassed Fernando Po because of the baffling winds that had disabled their sails. The island was located in a gap at the inner margins of the West African and South Atlantic slaving and circulation systems and was spared involvement in the transatlantic slave trade because of this and various other reasons, including the fact that, um, that including the resolute, because of the resolute isolationism of its indigenous booby inhabitants, and because from the 1820s to the 1950s, uh, armed with steamships and at least from the Spanish crown, uh, the British came as kind of naval merchant and missionary uh, settlers as well, and abolitionists. Uh, and, the, and they set up this first settlement of Clarence in the, in the early 19th century, and um, there lived uh, several thousand former captives rescued from slave ships, or who were joined by deserting slaves from Sao Tome, a nearby Portuguese island, and from literal African city, uh, city states such as Bimbia and Cameroon, who rode themselves on the island on canoes, because it was this kind of a uh, uh, it was an island where slavery didn't exist in the middle of almost the height of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, when Spanish Jesuits started arriving to sort of reclaim the island for the Spanish, uh, there, was, there was alarm amongst this heterogeneous but free population as Jamaican ba Baptist missionaries on the island had spread the rumor, quoting, that we the Spanish are coming with the sole objective of bringing slaves to kill and cannibalize, etc. What is hated most in Fernando Po is precisely slavery. Within a year of the first permanent Spanish government-sponsored expedition in 1858, the governor, Chacon, tried to reassure the population and declare slavery abolished. Um, this was done before in Cuba and Puerto Rico. Uh, even though actually slavery was non-existent on the island and practically non-existent in the previous century. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, the subsequent century of Spanish imperialism in Fernando Po and its buildup of large cacao plantations was characterized by contemporaries as and academics as involving a labor regime, quote, that made the distinction between slave and contract worker at times no more than nominal. And this is from Ibrahim Sundiata, the historian who's written about um, this, uh, Fernando Po and the Barra Biafra and the era of abolition. Um, Fernando Po's plantations are sometimes 
placed alongside uh, Sao Tome and Sao Tome and the German plantations in Mount Cameroon um, as part of um, as part of the, 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 the initiation initiating of kind of a, of a plantation colonies in, in West Africa in early colonialism but it's actually more connected to, to the Spanish Antilles, to Cuba. Um, unlike the great Portuguese African Empire, Spain had no political, political control over a hinterland, um, except Rio Muni, a small enclave on the mainland from the late 1920s on, from where it would administratively arrange for the supply of labor under new imperial regimes, that imperial forced labor, taxation, this was most common in uh, British, French, uh, Belgian empires, but the Spanish had no hinterland. So recruitment could not operate through militarized levy. Um, and these were only imposed on the indigenous people in Fernando Po briefly and less effectively in, in comparison to, to free market labor recruitment, which I'll get into. Um, so this kind of exceptional and unique confluence of circumstances meant that to get laborers onto its emerging plantations, uh, it brought in a contract system devised in Cuba uh, that could generate uh, financial intermediation to arrange for informal labor recruiters uh, to bring labor at a distance through a network of, uh, of brokers and, and vessels and private recruiters, all informally arranged. So there was no treaty uh, to, um, um, to contract laborers or to bring laborers, which is what the French did also in, in parts of uh, French Congo and Dahomey. Um, but no. Um, but the Spanish had to kind of devise a different system since. So the, um, when the plantations took off, uh, really at the early 20th century, and they were kind of starting to surround the island and eventually kind of encompass it, um, the, the majority of recruiters, recruited workers were actually uh, Fang from the, an area of southern Cameroon, Rumuni, and Gabon. And it's an interesting case because so, over here, and this is also an area actually spared involvement in the slave trade. There was no kind of coastal kingdoms or militarized, uh, uh, um, you know, formations involved in the slave trade there. Um, so the Fang kind of migrated there in the late 19th century, and um, and they had actually uh, no no they had avoided the slave trade and had. Uh, little commercial tradition in comparison to West African societies with a long history of money and merchants and things like this. Um, so, but they did form the primary labor force, which, um, which is, uh, I mean, which which shows that that there wasn't a continuity in forms of recruitment of slavery into contract labor. There was a kind of different underpinnings. Um, so I, I'm empirically, it's this kind of elaborate ethnographic historical kind of detail, but in summary, um, the, I could say that the Fang, they were kind of brought in into the kind of new contract labor system um, through what the Spanish called enganche or hook, um, which combined localized and only partially imperial recruitment networks. There was the recruiters were African, Creoles, some Portuguese, uh, but they weren't. They didn't have a military force behind them, so they couldn't operate with as much violence as uh, as previously. Um, so they had to combine the, the, these two elements: were the recruiters and a, a, a new urgency for for money, uh, which the recruiters were, would distribute as as wage advances um, by the inclusion of imported commodities and colonial money into the reproduction of uh, of their own societies. And this is a switch that happens autonomously. It's not imposed from above. There's an acceptance of uh, different uh, new imported commodities, cloth, alcohol, uh, and monies to translate into these commodities uh, in order to, to reproduce the, uh, essentially a, a matrimonial networks, which is, um, which is the overarching and kind of structural feature of, of the Fang uh, decentralized uh, lineage society. Um, so, following the flows of imported monies and, uh, and a type of commercialization of social payments and ceremonial obligations such as bride wealth, uh, 
um, there's a clear contrast with the period of the slave trade and the colonial situation. Because uh, many African scholars have highlighted the, that the commodification of social obligations during the slave trade was itself a supply of, of the slave trades, as uh, Ugo Mukeji in his book The Slave Trade and Culture in the Bight of Biafra sh um, has shown in the early 19th century in Nigeria and the Igbo areas, a new class of creditors appeared and severe debt collectors to enslave defaulters on marriage payments. Um, but this picture becomes uh, a, bit more, a bit more unstable and reversible under colonial rule when many more African societies uh, became further exposed and fully appropriated the qualities of commercial money. And it's, it's interesting because it's, it's, it can't be a coincidence that most of the laborers of Tafran Po came from relatively egalitarian lineage societies with little history of the slave trade, where bride wealth was uh, astronomically high. And this is the case actually also of the Igbo in, in Nigeria in the 20th century, and previously, for example, the crew in Liberia, uh, or Liberia in Cote d'Ivoire, what, what became Liberia. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, nine minutes. Nine minutes, oh, okay. No more time is Let's see. Uh, this is just the, to get a sense of the... Um, so forms of labor control after slavery and the devices colonial powers introduced to overcome abolition and their need for labor uh, such as penal, tributary labor, debt bondage, uh, indentureship, apprenticeship, obligatory contracts, have been extensively studied in African and Atlantic transitions away from slave labor. Um, one of the most impressive assessments is uh, this, it's a French book by Jan Mulier Boutin uh, uh, titled Desclavage au Salariat. Here uh, he, he defines that the primary feature of this transition was the mutation of slavery uh, into various things, but amongst others, labor under contract. <coughs> and this under contract was part of a kind of long sunset informed by the, by the dismantling of, of, slavery, of, of slavery. And in the case, case of Fernando Poe, this is quite, quite backtrackable, quite traceable to the history of kind of the fragmentation of Cuban slavery, um, the, the lack of um, I mean, the time frame, the legal definitions of, uh, of, of the contract as a type of apprenticeship, obligatory, irrevocable, um, not voluntary. As soon as you arrive on the island, you, you have to make a contract. Um, because it was defined as a contract with the state. So people who arrived um, were usually immigrants. Uh, they didn't come in families. Even the immigrants, they came kind of alone. So they were... Um, uh, the state defined itself as, as you know, as the, the the kinless would now belong to the state. So that was the the justification for the kind of obligatory contracts. Um, contracts and slavery they form an unsettling pairing. They can neither be historically separated nor identified with each other, in spite of the proximity and intermingling, and in spite of uh, the analogous presence of, of severe violence on the work site. Um, and the analogous commercialization of, of recruitment of contract labor. So there's a lot of uh, the missionaries, especially, they were kind of obsessed with re recognizing slavery again after its abolition. So people are being sold by recruiters to the planters or plantation regimes like slavery because there's, there's kind of uh, quite, um, how do you say, abuse with impunity and uh, private, private abuse, although most of the abuse gets Gets, gets nationalized, so the police takes over the discipline, um, but it's the same type of uh, torture. Um, but the juxtaposition of contracts and slavery is most unsettling, uh, because plantations were and could be worked on by both without interruption, from slavery to contract labor, but with an inverted premise, voluntary or involuntary displacement. And And then, then this is a this is a problem because it's it. I mean, in the absence of uh, of of being able to generate a a, a a slave market of organizing an internal predatory subjugation of tribute laborers, um, what indentured labor allowed was for the displacement of labor through individualized debts and never more than a few dozen transport merchants and brokers. Um, 
and and yeah, this is the character of, of labor recruitment, not only in Fernando Po, elsewhere too, in plantation colonies, that people would return. They wouldn't expect to be uh, to become landholders or self-employed afterwards. They were keen on going back home with with some, with their earnings. Um, and this is what um, what marked the the logic and character of, of recruitment. Um, and this is also, what also marked marks the kind of unstable history of labor recruitment because after every few years, between two and five years was the contract, uh, laborers needed to come from somewhere else. People didn't come back, they didn't, they didn't make a career as laborers. Um, they made their money and either found other places to make an income or became uh, cash crop farmers. Um, so there's this kind of dynamic of recruitment that is continuous, always uh, hooking in kind of uh, um, new societies and new people. But you couldn't, the same recruiter couldn't operate in the same area twice. Um, and then, so contracts, they were, I mean, people, so people were intending to return, but nevertheless, the, the type of contracts and the kind of uh, asocial subordination as defined by them, this kind of obedience, it's kind of inscribed in the contract, this unquestionable obedience to orders, um, uh, was experienced as a type of, of, of slavery, as plenty of petitions from workers and, and, and worker representatives um, in the archive safe. So, for example, in 1931, kind of found chiefs from the coast. They say, inside the island of Fernando Po, the treatment is the same as that of a slave. In the jails, it's worse, the raids on vagrants, etc. Um, but nevertheless, um, the, the process of recruitment was, was radically different because it involved this, uh, this release of, 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 of almost the total sum wages of the contract in the form of an advance, which is also the way uh, the, the, the Fang were, were demanding their money uh, as a type of advance so it could immediately translate into a kind of a, into a gain. Um, so labor recruitment could not operate through direct relations of political domination, but only through the intense commercialization of both intermediation. So there was a large army of recruiters taking their commission, uh, which was kind of misread as a type of new slave traders emerging. Um, and the, the intense commercialization of, uh, of social life. Um, and actually recruiters, they were most effective in societies um, that were in a kind of peripheral, marginal colonial space. Um, that were still, uh, that were um, um, semi-colonized and kind of um, um, self-determined because even on when kind of conquest fully happens in the crew and fang areas in the 1930s, then the type of labor becomes forced labor, infrastructure for the government and things like this, so then actually labor recruitment uh, ceases. Um, and then um, but then, yeah, so there's a kind of history of, uh, of, of, of not really a type of resistance, but a type of continued autonomy uh, at, at its margins, even uh, while subjecting yourself to a kind of a new colonial labor regime. Um, they, the, the, this kind of aspects of self-determination actually um, didn't allow colonial powers because they were expecting to create a kind of long-term, dependable labor force. Um, but then, the fact that the the value of social economies was ever escalating, um, uh, it, it meant that kind of wage labor economy just wasn't enough to cover people's expectations and, and needs. So people came up with all other ways of making money except labor, contract labor, because there was actually quite small sums of money, which was the whole point of a contract to keep down labor costs. Um, so then there's this kind of uh, aspect of, of resistance through money as well. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, I'd like to invite the, the presenters back up here. So I have to say, the, the thing that I found most interesting about this panel, panel, and this is, I guess, kind of selfish because it's 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 something that I've I've really been interested in thinking about um, recently, is this issue of debt, basically, and how 
debt kind of intersects with the idea of slavery or what debt's relationship is to the idea of slavery. And if you're anything like me, when you hear debt and slavery, your mind goes you know, first to, OK, well, someone falls into debt, and they're, then they're enslaved. Um, but what I, think all of, what, what I think all of these three papers uh, do, uh, and do really well, is show how complex this relationship is, thinking both about uh, the onset of slavery, but also a release from slavery uh, as well, uh, how this idea of debt exists in kind of nuanced ways and how it shapes uh, the institutions or institutions itself. Um, so I guess a selfish question I would, I would pose to the, uh, the, the panel, um, and I know that, that, that this has already come up in, in your papers as well too, um, but you know, in your own work, where do you see the idea of debt kind of shaping how we understand slavery or the release from slavery or, or perhaps why is debt such kind of an integral part of this discussion? So I don't, any, any more thoughts or anything that you want to, to share? Well, I want to hear what you have to say. Oh, well, I mean, uh, I'm sort of nervous that I'm just going to be repeating <laughs> what I just presented. So maybe you can talk and then I can sort of think through. OK. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so in the case of Roman slavery, I think that um, there's, it's a long, for a long time it's been understood that, uh, you know, manumission could be, didn't have to be purchased, but could be compensated for by this continuing relationship between a free person and a patron. Um, and um, that's very easy to see in cases when, like, the freed person does a particular forms of labor after they're freed. Like, it's often was the case that business agents were, uh, slaves were freed in order to act as business agents. Um, so what I'm interested in doing is, um, moving beyond that sort of stereotypical example of the slave um, freed to be a business agent to look at what other kinds of um, sort of work was performed after the release from slavery um, that continued to compensate the former owner. Or like, or, 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 for, for, or if I can be specific, I guess, thinking about Enrique, right? Um, thinking about uh, not just I guess not slavery as being the result, or bondage perhaps maybe being the result of debt, but almost being the result of credit. And does that change the way that we think about it, if people are using, I mean, if people are going into this without possibly, or in some cases, uh, a financial debt, but looking forward as an advance, um, as a way of, of paying uh, social debts, mm -hmm. right? And, and I mean, does this change how we understand, uh, um, you know, kind of contract labor in the situation? Yeah, I mean, because the debt has a, has a bad rap. It's a kind of it's a source of domination, of control, of subordination. Um, but in the archive, people seek out debts. People are actually looking to, for creditors. Mm -hmm. And once recruiters come and give out monies as, as an acceptable currency, then people don't really care about the recruiters. They care about fulfilling their social obligations, which is for example, a lot of the recruiters, they were, they were paying for the divorce of a, of a sister or of a mother because you need to compensate debts. So debts are already created within the internal dynamics of the society. Mm -hmm. um, but then, but it's not necessarily always related to labor, it's more related to obligation, to a sense of kind of, of community, whereas capitalism uh, turns debt into a way of extracting labor from people. So it, it moves people away for a few years and kind of makes them pay off their, their normal, ordinary debts through uh, kind of exploitation in a in separate space. Um, so I suppose debt be can become co-opted, easily co-opted by a kind of by capitalist accumulation. But it's not necessarily something that always ends up in a kind of, uh, in a self-imploding or engulfing uh, situation because debt is also part of the qualities of, of, of relatedness. So. Yeah. If I could, or, yeah. but the other thing I was thinking about yours uh, too, Yesenia, is again this idea of how debt might play into the conversation or obligation um, when thinking about kind of full emancipation versus gradual emancipation, mm. and the way they're thinking about how slavery is going to, to end, not just for the individual but for um, uh, the kind of larger society as well. I mean, any any thoughts about that or? Uh, yeah, well, um, one thing that actually I think um, Enrique that made me uh, sort of think about 
I mean, what's, what's, what's really interesting about this period of gradual emancipation um, in Colombia, which I'm studying, um, is, as I mentioned before, uh, there was this um, process by which non-kin or strangers can purchase the children of the free womb, and essentially they would be paying off the debt, right, incurred by their new masters. Um, but what I didn't talk about in this presentation was um, that um, the law also uh, made it possible for parents to pay off the debt um, for, of their um, children of the free womb, um, just because I didn't have a lot of time to get into it. So it's interesting to think about um, the possibilities that actually that debt um, created um, for um, uh, enslaved or free black parents to purchase purchase back their children. I mean, I say possibilities because um, essentially um, paying off alimentos was cheaper than paying off the, uh, the possession of an enslaved person. So for example, a seven-year-old child would cost 40 pesos to pay off the compensation, but on the slave market, had that child been born a slave, they would have cost most likely 120 pesos. Um, and so it's an interesting kind of uh, uh, contradictory world that it creates, yeah. This new, yeah. Well, are there questions here, let's say? Uh, here, how about first, uh, in the front? A very general question, actually, um, which also goes out to um, the whole panel, and maybe also to, you know, and to everyone. Uh, something that didn't really come up so far in the conference was uh, uh, discussing the definition of slavery, what actually it is. And all of these <coughs> presentations uh, um, share or make, make sort of a similar irritation, namely that. Uh, um, that operating on the dichotomy of free and unfree, uh, which is so common today in discussing slavery, <clears throat> gets very difficult once you look into the material, right? And, and you say, yeah, you get this distinction between the slavery, and there was limited slave, limited time spans of slavery. And, uh, um, in, in Rome, uh, uh, you didn't only have free and unfree, right? You had very different types of freedom and degrees of freedom. Um, how were what, what was the essence there how, how, how uh, of slavery? How what was that defined? You can't go by the term, right? They didn't have the term. Um, you had salvos, you had Mkela, you had all these different kinds of slaves. Freed women who weren't fully free, but who was fully free, not everyone who was fully free was fully free in what we were, right? And then uh, um, different types of bondage. So what, what I'd really like to know more about is uh, uh, what in your work, you, you consider it to be the essence of slavery, the defining characteristics, um, and how to kind of assemble the different phenomena you, you discuss under this term. That's a big question. It reminds me actually of your paper, mm -hmm. which both of you I loved, um, where you're talking about the inadequacies of terms like yeah. enslaved and free. Yeah, I yeah, I think yeah. that, um, yeah, the more I've studied slavery in the ancient world, the more I've yeah, come to be dissatisfied with those terms because um, there are so many in-between statuses. So freed wives are just one category. Um, there's you know slaves of kin, slaves owned by slaves, owned by slaves, um, people who are considered free in life but slaves in death. I mean, just endless numbers of, of different types of statuses. And um, I think that you know you can look for at a very strict legal definition of what a slave is, um, but uh, if you try to place that in the social world, it becomes really inadequate. And I think the biggest issue for me um, is that you know as we talked about yesterday with ancient evidence is that um, I don't have a sense of what an enslaved person would say is the nature of their servitude. Yeah. That, and you can just look at the legal text. Well, for Rome, you can't. Mm. You cannot because they don't use the term slave. They have many different terms. So, what is the approach to assemble all these different kinds of what we call slavery in one category? Um, I think that the, in Roman law, there's a very defined category of slave. I mean, one of the first things that you get in compilations of law is there are free people and there are slaves. Those are the two major categories of people, right? And then the they admit, oh, well, there are also freed people. Um, but I think that within, that legally speaking, it's actually quite distinct. I just don't know how well that maps on to the social world. I don't know if you have no, I, I would agree. I would agree. Well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> any, any thoughts about the definition of slavery? 
Well, because my I had to deal with the issue of of the of the revival of the specter of a revival of slavery, which kind of kicks off in kind of the severe exploitations in African colonies, which is called modern day slavery, and the language of today is rooted in this colonial period. Um, but it's a type of mis misrecognizing and a conflation. Slavery becomes a variety of different things, and then, um, but uh, unrelated to actually previous forms of, of slavery, which were much more predatory and, and voluntary, because you know even debt bondage today it's classified as slavery in the modern slavery index, but it's similar relationships mm -hmm. of of kind of dependency, financial needs, family situations, and things like this. Um, so that's kind of my problem was to was to not not become dependent on on the rhetorics of slavery, which is a, mm. which is a political move mm. for NGOs mm. today, basically. Mm. Other questions? Oh, Rosia. So, yeah, so one thing that I didn't get into is that the the background of these different relationships that might end up as being described on an inscription as um, as a patron and husband or freed woman and wife are extremely diverse. So in some cases, it seems that those people, um, the reason that they have these double ties of kinship is because there was a pre-existing union. Um, one of them was freed before the other, and as you were saying, they bought their partner out of slavery and therefore became the patron in name, at least. Um, uh, in other cases, um, and we know this because these epitaphs are often found on the frontiers of the Roman world, um, the, the patrons who are buying these women and then freeing them and, um, to be married to them are soldiers. Um, they were never enslaved in their life, and almost certainly the relationship began in the context of a master-slave dynamic. So what's interesting to me is that surely the sort of significance of this proprietary relationship had really different meanings in these different kinds of relationships, and yet in our evidence they all appear sort of under the same title. Um, they all appear in the epitaphs in the same way, and so you, we can't really distinguish between them and, and that makes it very interesting to me because obviously it would have, in lived experience, been an extremely different situation. It was your, I saw a question there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you all for your papers. I had a question kind of uh, building off of the debt mm -hmm. uh, discussion for Yesenia. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested uh, if you could say a little bit more about um, some of the children who were born under the free, free womb law, what happened to them after they mm -hmm. came of age? And so, you know, for example, did they receive freedom dues or something like that? Um, and, or, you know, like, um, did they turn to wage labor or, you know, peasant farming? Um, I'm just wondering, you know, like, or whether they were reinscribed into relations of debt, which I think Matthew mm -hmm. maybe was something up. So just to hear. Right. Um, I wish I knew the answer, but the archive does not give me anything, really. Um, and I think that might be sort of an answer, actually, um, in terms of the disappearance of the children of the free woman. That might be actually um, telling of a, I would hope, a fulfillment of full freedom, um, meaning that the state could no longer really control their whereabouts. Um, and so uh, once they reached the age of 18, um, they would, um, formally speaking, have to um, show themselves before the uh, what were called manumission uh, juntas or local councils of uh, kind of uh, rep uh, yeah, honorable men, uh, typically the mayor and the notary and so forth of their local village where they lived, um, prove that they had been honorable to their master. Um, uh, I haven't found any cases where um, they, um, the children were essentially bonded back to their masters for any sort of, you know, um, uh, any uh, behavior that was not fulfilling of their their um, their duties as children of the free womb. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, the region that I study is on the Pacific coast of Colombia, um, which was a very rural um, uh, region with literally hundreds of rivers, um, jungles, um, 
and it, there were um, historic runaway um, enslaved settlements um, throughout, uh, particularly the northern uh, lowlands of Colombia. And so it's, a, it's an interesting region um, to look at because uh, we, there was a huge um, challenge of imposing wage labor in the post-emancipation period. Um, in fact, in my, my, my book manuscript, I'm looking at essentially what I'm calling um, a strike that occurs um, right after 1852, where um, essentially all the, the black folk of this region just simply refuse to perform any kind of labor for the uh, former um, enslaved white holding class white enslaved, um, for, sorry, white slave holding class. Um, so yeah, th I, I wish I could tell you more, but perhaps the archive doesn't really, it, it's telling of, of something. Um, I'm hopeful that um, that um, these, that this generation of youth, uh, you know, we're no longer within the uh, grips of the master class. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you again for your presentation. All my questions for when you were talking about the genealogical inheritability of slavery, you said that it, um, it often led to what I believe you referred to as natal alienation. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you just expand on that, that idea or concept. Right. Um, so what what I was talking about was when I said the genealogical heritability of slavery, I was talking about the um, oh we were talking about the Roman uh, yeah legal the partis secretary ventrum right yeah um, which I have learned is not this kind of. <laughs> Yeah, we have an overlapping interest in this topic. Yeah. Right <laughs> um, her forthcoming article is going to be awesome about it. <laughs> in any case, um, so I was referring to that, um, which is essentially what um, uh, made chattel slavery legally possible, that, that legal doctrine. And so uh, what I was talking about was with natal alienation specifically, uh, was looking at the um, children of the free womb. So um, they were no longer um, um, enslaved. Uh, precisely because the argument goes um, that their mothers birthed free, birthed free um, quote unquote, citizens in the making. And so um, nevertheless, as I show, um, <clears throat> they were sold as, um, as, as, as uh, separate objects of debt on the, uh, on essentially on, on the slave market. Um, and so what I was interested in looking at um, is the, um, the natal, natal alienation that's produced uh, when, even though uh, in the uh, separability of the mother and child. Um, just really briefly, what's really interesting is that the, um, the law of the free womb, uh, what it says is that the mother had the right to claim, um, hold on to their child the free womb until the child was of, um, uh, reached the age of puberty. And so what I look at in my book are these really, um, interesting lawsuits, essentially, where the, the mother is um, fighting for very specific um, kind of definitions of puberty. Uh, but that's another kind of story. Other questions? Yes. Um, I have a question kind of for the um, panel. Can you talk about different aspects of slavery and uh, post-slavery system? Um, would you say, so the systems that emerge post uh, slavery, um, would you argue that these systems are more cruel than the original, or do they just, or do they maintain a certain uh, level of cruelty that's consistent across? They just maybe change certain aspects, and also, are there certain protections that, or certain new criteria that formerly enslaved persons can now? used to say fight for newer rights. So um, for example, with Catherine, so the children born during the um, marriage of post men mm -hmm. are uh, legitimate, and so they may escape slavery yeah. for that next generation mm -hmm. as opposed to the children before. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um. It depends on the area, and I would say that what I tried to say with this kind of fragmentation of, of slavery is that aspects are a continued intensification of exploitation, overseer violence, state discipline, even even kind of planter planter's ideology doesn't change that quickly, um, and legally statuses change, but then realities are are usually informal. Uh, most justice happens outside the courts uh, because it's informal, it's private, it's 
I mean, in these type of uh, colonial, colonial settings. Um, but then, but it's an open question. I think it's clearly uh, uh, informed, or uh, it, uh, the backdrop is there, and people's metaphor is slavery. So that's why, even in kind of um, you know, in, in colonies of severe exploitation, such as the Congo or in kind of French West Africa, people use slavery, even though they 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 they're told that technically it's over, but then their their experience of the situation, disempowerment violence, uh, the metaphors that they use in the 20th century is a kind of slavery, um, but it's another, it's, it, they also have other words, so it's, it's more important to include the, 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 their entire vocabulary, but that, that forms part of the backdrop, so to say. Yesterday, one of the big discussions was the relationship of the archive to the literature, and so I have some sense of how that plays out with Roman mm -hmm. slavery, but since you didn't use any literature other than, uh, I would be loath to call legal writing literature, but <laughs> I, I, I'm willing to entertain that. I, 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 this is more for the other two panelists of uh, literature, since I don't know anything about your historical context, of literature can be uh, synthesized with the archive in any meaningful way. <laughs> <laughs> Hers was nice <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, obviously, Sade Harmon would say things far more <laughs> uh, better than I would. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, well, literally speaking, I don't really... I think that... Um, I try to, as much as possible, um, kind of take hold of a literary imagination in my work, um, precisely because I refuse to kind of take the master's word for it. Um, this is the um, you know master's archive that all of us are, in some shape, way, or form, are are um, trying to um, to work through, right? Um, so um, I'm certainly in my own. I guess theoretically, I'm deeply um, kind of influenced by Sadia Hartman and Christina Sharp and Marisa Fuentes um, and folks who are really kind of digging through the um, problematics of the archive um, and um, what I think Christina Sharp talks about the archival hold um, uh, and pushing back against that. So, but that's I think a, a, something that I'm really trying to work through. And I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. I'd love to hear. More, yes. This is just a totally random question, which is yeah. probably a stupid one, but because you mentioned um, one of the architects of the Free Boom Law, mm. the um, Jose Felipe Restrepo, mm -hmm. um, he's not an ancestor of Laura Restrepo. Speaking of literature, is he? Restrepo, I don't know. It, I mean, how uncommon is the name? Because um, if we're talking Restrepo about literature from the Master's Archive, she's like a really well-known Colombian. Yeah, well, so. in Colombia, actually, so one of the figures I study is um, Jorge, um, George Isaac. Um, so Jorge Isaac. Um, George Isaac is a very important slaveholder, um, Jewish, English, Jamaican um, slaveholder who comes to the Pacific Coast of Colombia in the early 19th century. Essentially, his son writes Maria, which is this kind of... Um, it's the quintessential Spanish romantic novel of the 19th century. Um, it's terrible, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's this kind of uh, sort of, um, what's the word, slave apologist kind of literature. So I do incorporate that. That's a very concrete example. Great, okay. Well, we've uh, reached the end of our time here. So another round of applause, please, for our panelists.